Hi everyone. Today I want to talk a bit more about root rot and what causes it and also what you can do to prevent it and treat it when you start getting it. So let's dive into it, shall we? So when it comes to root rot, you're probably wondering, that's something that occurs when you water your plants, because people assume that it's all about the water. It's not quite as simple as that, because if you think about it, most of these tropical plants, because most of the house plants that we have in our homes tend to be from tropical regions, they are from rainforests, which, say it with me, rainforest, it rains a lot. So there's obviously an awful lot of water that is falling down on these plants on a regular basis. But the point that you need to start thinking about when it comes to root rot isn't that there's an abundance of water and it rots out the roots, it's actually that there's a lack of oxygen. Now, ironically enough, the one thing that I did want to show you, which I don't have purely because I don't trust it because it's so easy to get root rot for a lot of your plants, is peat moss heavy houseplant potting soil. I don't have that. I usually use exclusively coco coir, which is um, shredded coconut husk essentially, purely because again it doesn't have the same quantities at peat moss. Peat moss I think as well, don't quote me on this, but I think it's also not necessarily a renewable resource at the moment, so there's only so much to go around. So if you can kind of steer away from it on ecological reasons is probably a good thing as well, but think about Peat moss will come from peat bogs. And if you've ever been to a bog, you'll generally see it this, there's a lot of water, but there's a lot of stagnant water within the actual soil media there. And a lot of the times, if you have been to a peat bog, you can usually distinguish a smell as well. And that is, if I'm not mistaken, it's anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic means that they survive in areas where there's no or very little oxygen. So what happens when you water your plants and you're using just average regular potting soil, you haven't put any perlite in or anything like that? Essentially, it pulls the water in like a sponge and essentially it just stays there for a very long period of time. There's no air pockets so that this anaerobic bacteria can't survive within airy conditions, essentially. So it will thrive. And essentially what it then starts doing is it starts rotting the root. That's where you would get root rot. So that's the thing that you need to remember when it comes to root rot. It's less about the water and it's more about the absence of air within the soil. So again, think about it. If you've got airy, chunky soil, air can flow through that soil, reach the roots, and it doesn't mean that any kind of bacteria that might be on the roots is going to thrive because essentially what do these anaerobic bacteria hate? Air. So few things you can do to avoid this at an early stage, so kind of preemptive, is looking at creating a good airy soil mix. And I have got a video on my profile, do go and check it out. I think it's in one of the featured stories at the top. But just to give you a bit of an example, this is a lot of the items that you can put into soil mix to essentially amend it and make it airier. So you can see here, You've got some lecker, which is clay expanded pellets. Um, you can see here some orchid bark. And that again will create that kind of chunkiness. This one, because it was from an orchid mix, I think it had this thing called ceramis, which I think is just basically little broken parts of clay. You've got perlite, which is expanded volcanic rock. I've also got, there's a very small one here, some vermiculite. Vermiculite you need to be careful with because it tends to retain moisture a bit more than any of these other things, but it also does create that chunkiness in the soil. And obviously the coco coir itself can be quite airy and it doesn't retain the moisture quite like the sponge that is peat moss. So that's the one thing you can do is make sure that you're using the correct soil. Or even if you can't, if you don't have the capability of making your own, your own soil mix, see if you can at least, if the only thing you can buy is peat moss heavy houseplant soil, and that's, that's the hilarity of it, a lot of the times they sell houseplant soil, which is predominantly peat moss, which is not ideal. But what you can do if you don't have a lot of space, just buy some um, either 
vermiculite, probably not vermiculite, but a bit more of perlite or maybe some orchid bark and mix that together with that soil just to create that airiness and again to avoid, to avoid that bacteria from kind of thriving in that environment. The other thing you can do is make sure that you're using the correct pot. So if you're really worried about root rot, probably less of a worry for a lot of the ferns, but it will be for things like the aroids, like this um, Anthurium vichii, the King Anthurium that I've got in front of me. So you can use something like terracotta. And the reason for that is it will draw the moisture out of the soil media much faster. So it won't be sitting in the soil itself. And essentially what, what you'll get with that is the soil drying out a bit faster, which will again create some of that air and it will be less oxygen deprived because there won't be any water stagnating within the actual soil itself. The other thing is make sure for all of your houseplants please, especially for succulents, I cannot believe that people are still selling succulents in pots that don't have drainage holes, make sure that there is a drainage hole. And again remember these plants a lot of the time, not the succulents, but most of the other houseplants are coming in from rainforests. Don't do this little drizzle of water because you're worried that you're going to cause root rot. Use the right soil, use the right pot and flush the water all the way through. Imagine again how these plants are growing. They get this deluge of water that will happen daily and um, quite frequently actually sometimes think about monsoon seasons. So they do need to get watered thoroughly, but just make sure that there's a drainage hole at the bottom because that means that excess water can drain out quite nicely. The other thing that you can do if you really want to up your game is you can go for something like a net pot. These things you can usually find, I think on eBay as well, they can be uh, eBay, Amazon uh, and specialist stores. A lot of the specialist stores that sell these, sell these for hydroponics. So you can get them in different sizes. You can see here, there's all these different sizes. There's small ones, there's medium ones, there's large ones, there's even larger ones than this. And if you don't like the look of this, you can always get a cash po, which is just a decorative pot, pop it in. And granted, this one's probably not the best example. You can still see a bit of the lip there, but essentially you create the, the same aspect that you still get a bit of an airflow. This one's a bit tight. I wouldn't suggest this. I'd probably go up one size in terms of a cash po, just so that there's a bit of air in between. And you still give that airiness to the plants, the soil isn't kind of stagnating with water and you can kind of go down that way as well. The other thing when it comes to prevention is buying one of these, buying a moisture meter. So you can see, apologies, this is a bit dirty, but you can see a moisture meter and what you would do is there's a sensor at the bottom here and you would just dip it into the soil of the plant pot, take the meter reading, so for a lot of the aroids, generally you'd want it to just be turning into the dry region of that. With alocasias, you want to be watering roughly when it's between dry and moist. And with most ferns, calathea, the prayer plants, you want to make sure that it stays within that kind of moist region essentially. But very rarely do you want to have a plant that stays in the wet region for very, very long because then you're going to start coming into problems even with moisture loving plants like the ferns, like the, the calatheas and the prayer plants essentially. So just bear that in mind, but this is a well worth investment. If you've got more than five or 10 plants and you wanna make sure that you're not gonna kill them essentially by overwatering, because at the moment there's a pandemic, everybody's stuck at home. You kind of sit there going, oh, can I water my plants yet? Can I water my plants yet? Because it gives you something to do. Keep in mind that it's a sure way that you might kill them if you water them too much, but this little thing will help you not do that essentially, because what you should be doing isn't saying that a plant needs to be watered every seven or 10 days. You should at every seven or 10 days, if you've got the kind of hang of roughly how um, your plant will absorb moisture is every seven or 10 days before you water, measure with a moisture meter. If it's not utilizing the water fast enough, it might be signifying that it stayed wet for too long and it might have root rot. So monitor that plant, but obviously don't water it at that point, wait until it starts going down towards the moist or the dry region and then water it. But that's the point we should be, what you should be doing is measuring and then watering if needed, essentially at that point. And that will help you a lot of the times. And you can see here, this is um, the King Anthurium, as I was saying, this is in a net pot. It doesn't look great, but I'm not so fast about having it in um, a decorative pot. You can see some yellowing at the bottom here, but these are the very, very first leaves that this plug plant came with. But you can see it's growing really, really happily and it's getting bigger by the day, essentially. So 
really, really happy. Net pots are wonderful, I find, for most anthuriums because they can be even more temperamental than some philodendrons. So just bear that in mind. That will give them the kind of aeration that they need because anthurium it are one of those arrows that generally, I find, like to stay on the moist side rather than going all the way to dry. Some philodendrons, not all of them, will be okay going all the way to dry, but just bear that in mind. And then, so these are all preventative measures. But say you've done all these things because you can still do all these things and there's still a risk that it might happen. It depends. Sometimes it will happen around the, um, the changing of the seasons between summer and winter where all of a sudden you're used to watering much more frequently because your plant is using up that moisture a lot faster. And in the winter, it tends to slow down a bit. So it can happen around that changing of the seasons. Now, if you start assuming that you've got some root rot, you'll start seeing some yellowing on the leaves, not just on the lower leaves, on the older leaves. You, need, you will probably start seeing some yellowing uh, happening on the leaves. You might even see some black moving up the stem. At that point, it's debatable whether or not that plant is salvageable. But what you want to do is just monitor it for a few days. If you don't see that it's getting any better and it seems that the plant is deteriorating and it's not drying out fast enough, try repotting it. Take it out of the soil, check the roots you will see that it's the roots would probably would have turned to a black mushy color that's usually a bit of a smell to it as well there's no way around this at that point get a pair of scissors get a pair of snippers have a spray bottle or have something that you can um, essentially clean whatever device you're going to use to cut so i use uh, rubbing alcohol and uh, you can run it under a, a flame just be careful with whatever you use but essentially what you're trying to do is sterilize the instrument that you're going to be cutting these rotted roots off and generally the consensus is if you see that say a root is that long and you can see root rot all the way down here and the rest of it seems like a whitish color and quite healthy don't cut just the root rot off I'd say cut a considerable amount of the white off as well. Leave some of the white on there as well because that's good root and it could kind of root out from there as well. But if you just cut the root rot off, you might have not have seen that it might have already progressed internally. So it might not be showing a difference in color. So just bear that in mind. But yeah, that's a bit more about root rot. Don't let it panic you. I have brought a lot of plants back from like the brink of death due to root rot. It is possible to do it. But as with most things, Prevention is better than treatment. So if you can actually get ahead of this so it doesn't, so you're giving your chance, the plants the best chance to not get root rot, that is the way to go. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about today. I know it's a bit of a bleaker topic, but I know some people stress about these things and at least I thought I'd give you some of the knowledge that I've acquired over the years. Um, if you've got any questions, if you've got any comments, if you do things differently, obviously everybody can do things in a very different way. Please do drop it in the comments down below and let's have that conversation. And yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your day and hopefully I shall hear, see you here soon. Thanks. Bye.